From the Conference Center Theater in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square from previous general conferences. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to members of the church and friends everywhere who are participating by means of television, radio, or the internet. The music for this session, which has been recorded previously, will be by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with various organists. The choir will now favor us with, Guide us, O thou great Jehovah. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Carl B. Cook of the Presidency of the Seventy. Our dear Father in heaven, humbly we bow our heads and thank thee for all of our blessings, including being gathered for this session of General Conference. We are supremely grateful to thee for thy Son, Jesus Christ, and his atonement. We are also grateful 
for prophets and apostles to lead and guide us in these unsettled times. We pray for those in need. Please bless them and help us to watch over and care for one another. Please bless those who will speak to us today and open our hearts and minds that we might receive inspiration. We love Thee, and we invite Thy Spirit to be with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 President Dallin H. Oaks will now present the general authorities Area 70s, and general officers of the Church for a sustaining vote. After which, Jared B. Larson, Managing Director of the Church Auditing Department, will read the annual report. President Oaks. Brothers and sisters, I will now present the General Authorities, Area 70s, and General Officers of the Church for your sustaining vote. Please express your vote in the usual way wherever you may be. If there are those who oppose any of the proposals, we ask that you contact your stake president. It is proposed that we sustain Russell Marion Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Dallin Harris Oaks as first counselor in the first presidency, and Henry Benyon Eyring as second counselor in the first presidency. Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain Dallin H. Oaks as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and M. Russell Ballard as acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Those in favor, please signify. Any opposed may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the following as members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, M. Russell Ballard, Jeffrey R. Holland, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, David A. Bednar, Quinton L. Cook, D. Todd Christofferson, Neil L. Anderson, Ronald A. Rasband, Gary E. Stevenson, Dale G. Renland, Garrett W. Gong, and Ulysses Sawatis. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed may so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the counselors in the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. As a matter of information, Elders Robert C. Gay and Terence W. Vinson will be released from their service as members of the Presidency of the Seventy, effective August 1, 2021. Those who wish to express gratitude to these brethren for their dedicated service may do so by the uplifted hand. The following Area 70s have been released. Elders Sean Douglas, Michael A. Dunn, Clark G. Gilbert, Alfred Kiyungu, Carlos G. Revilio, and Vianina Sikahima. Those who wish to join us in expressing appreciation for their excellent service, please manifest it. We have released the primary general presidency as follows. Joy D. Jones as president, Lisa L. Harkness as first counselor, and Christina B. Franco as second counselor. All who wish to join us in expressing appreciation to these sisters for their devoted service, 
Please manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain elders Paul V. Johnson and S. Mark Palmer to serve as members of the presidency of the 70, effective August 1st, 2021. Those in favor may manifest it. Any opposed by the same sign. It is proposed that we sustain the following as general authority 70s. Sean Douglas, Michael A. Dunn, Clark G. Gilbert, Patricio M. Giufra, Alfred Kiyungu, Alvin V. Tripp Meredith, Carlos G. Revilio, Jr., and Vianina Sikahima. All in favor, please manifest it. Those opposed, by the same sign. It is proposed that we sustain the new Area 70s as announced by the Church earlier this week. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed by the same sign. It is proposed that we sustain as the new primary general presidency, Camille N. Johnson as president, Susan Elizabeth Porter as first counselor, and Amy Eileen Wright as second counselor. Those in favor, manifest it. Any opposed may so signify. It is proposed that we sustain the other general authorities, Area 70s, and general officers as presently constituted. All in favor, please manifest it. Those opposed, if any. Again, those who oppose any of the proposals are invited to contact their stake presidents. Thank you for your continued faith and prayers in behalf of the leaders of the Church. As announced, Jared B. Larson will now read the Church Audit Report for 2020. To the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Dear Brethren, Directed by revelation, as recorded in section 120 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Council on the Disposition of the Tithes, composed of the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and the Presiding Bishopric, authorizes the expenditure of Church funds. Church entities disperse funds in accordance with approved budgets, policies, and procedures. Church auditing, which consists of credentialed professionals, and is independent of all other church departments and entities, has responsibility for, uh, to perform audits for the purpose of providing reasonable assurance regarding contributions received, expenditures made, and safeguarding of church assets. Based upon audits performed, church auditing is of the opinion that in all material respects, contributions received, expenditures made, and assets of the Church for the year 2020 have been recorded and administered in accordance with approved Church budgets, policies, and accounting practices. The Church follows the practices taught to its members of living within a budget, avoiding debt, and saving against a time of need. Respectfully submitted, Church Auditing Department, Jared B. Larson, Managing Director. The choir will now favor us with, if I listen with my heart, after the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He, we will then view a previously recorded message from Elder Jorge T. Becerra of the Seventy, who is serving in the South 
America Northwest Area Presidency. Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. Prior to that first Easter, as Jesus concluded the new sacramental ordinance that he had administered to the Twelve, he began his majestic farewell discourse and moved toward Gethsemane, betrayal, and crucifixion. However, sensing the concern and perhaps even outright fear some of those men must have exhibited, he said this to them and to us. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. 
not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Challenging times come to those in this mortal world, including to the faithful. But the reassuring message of Christ is that although he, the paschal lamb, would go like a sheep before its shearers, he would nevertheless rise, as the psalmist said, to be our refuge and strength, our very present help in times of trouble. Realizing what difficult hours lay ahead for Christ as he moved toward the cross and for his disciples as they would take his gospel to the world in the meridian of time, go with me now to a related message for members of the Savior's Church in the latter days. It lies in the staggering number of verses in the Book of Mormon devoted to conflict of one kind or another, from Laman and Lemuel's eternally annoying behavior up to final battles involving hundreds of thousands of soldiers. One of the obvious reasons for this emphasis is that inasmuch as the Book of Mormon was written for a Latter-day audience, these authors, who experienced so much of war themselves, prophetically warn us that violence and conflict will be a signature characteristic of relationships in the last days. Of course, my theory about Latter-day contention isn't very original. 2,000 years ago, the Savior warned that in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars later saying that peace would be taken from the earth. Surely this Prince of Peace, who taught emphatically that contention is of the devil, surely he must weep along with his divine Father over those in the human family in our day who are without affection, the Scripture says, and who cannot figure out how to live together in love. Brothers and sisters, we do see too much conflict, anger, and general incivility around us. Fortunately, the current generation has not had a third world war to fight, nor have we experienced a global economic crash like the one in 1929 leading to a Great Depression. We are, however, facing a kind of third world war that is not a fight to crush our enemies, but a conscription marshalling the children of God to care more about each other and to help heal the wounds we find in a conflicted world. The Great Depression we now face has less to do with the external loss of our savings and more to do with the internal loss of our self-confidence, with real deficits of faith and hope and charity all around us. But the instruments we need to create a brighter day and grow an economy of genuine goodness are abundantly provided for in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot afford and this world cannot afford our failure to put these gospel concepts and fortifying covenants to full use personally and publicly. So, in a world tossed with tempest and not comforted, as Jehovah said it would be, how do we find what he called the covenant of peace? We find it by turning to him who said he would have mercy on us and with everlasting kindness grant peace to our children. In spite of frightful prophecies and unsettling scriptures declaring that peace would be taken from the earth generally, the prophets 
including our own beloved Russell M. Nelson, have taught that it does not have to be taken from us individually. So, this Easter, let's try to practice peace in a personal way, applying the grace and healing balm of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ to ourselves and our families and all those we can reach around us. Fortunately, even astonishingly, this soothing salve is made available to us without money and without price. Such help and hope is dearly needed because in this worldwide congregation today are many who struggle with any number of challenges, physical or emotional, social or financial, or a dozen other kinds of trouble. But many of these we are not strong enough to address in and of ourselves, for the help and peace we need is not the kind the world giveth. No, for the truly difficult problems, we need what the scriptures call the powers of heaven. And to access these powers, we must live by what these same scriptures call principles of righteousness. Now, understanding that connection between principle and power is the one lesson the human family never seems able to learn. So says the God of heaven and earth. And what are those principles? Well, they're listed repeatedly in Scripture. They're taught again and again and again in conferences like this. And in our dispensation, the prophet Joseph Smith was taught them in response to his own version of the cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the cold, uncaring confinement of Liberty Jail, he was taught that the principles of righteousness included such virtues as patience, long-suffering, gentleness, and love unfeigned. Absent those principles, it was certain we would eventually face discord and enmity. In that regard, may I speak for a moment about the absence in some quarters of these principles of righteousness in our time? As a rule, I'm an upbeat, cheerful kind of fellow. And there is so much that is so good and so beautiful in our world. Certainly we have more material blessings than any generation in all of history. But in 21st century cultural, culture generally and too often in the church, we still see lives that are in trouble with compromises resulting in too many broken covenants and too many broken hearts. Consider the coarse language that parallels sexual transgression, both of which are so omnipresent in movies or on television. Or note the sexual harassment and other forms of impropriety we read so much about in the workplace. In matters of covenantal purity, the sacred is too often being made common, and the holy is too often being made profane. To any who are tempted to walk or talk or behave in these ways, as the world giveth, so to speak, don't expect it to lead to peaceful experience. I promise you, in the name of the Lord, it won't. Wickedness never was happiness, an ancient prophet once said. When the dance is over, the piper 
must always be paid. And most often, it is in a currency of tears and regret. Or perhaps we see other forms of abuse or indignity. How doubly careful we have to be as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ not to fall victim to any such behavior. In no case are we to be guilty of any form of abuse or unrighteous dominion or immoral co coercion, not physical or emotional or ecclesiastical or any other kind. I remember feeling the fervor of President Gordon B. Hinckley a few years ago when he spoke to the men of the church regarding those he called tyrants in their own homes. How tragic and utterly disgusting a phenomenon is wife abuse, he said. Any man in this church who abuses his wife, who demeans her, who insults her, who exercises unrighteous dominion over her, is unworthy to hold the priesthood. He is unworthy to hold a temple recommend. Equally despicable, he said, was any form of child abuse or any other abuse. In too many instances, otherwise faithful men, women, and even children can be guilty of speaking unkindly, even destructively, to those to whom they may well be sealed by a holy ordinance in the temple of the Lord. Everyone has the right to be loved, to feel peaceful, and to find safety at home. Please, may we try to maintain that environment there. The promise of being a peacemaker is that you will have the Holy Ghost for your constant companion and blessings will flow to you without compulsory means forever. No one can employ a sharp tongue or unkind words and still sing on tune the song of redeeming love. May I close where I began? Tomorrow is Easter. A time for the righteous principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his atonement to pass over, pass over conflict and contention, pass over despair and transgression, and pass over ultimately over death. It's a time to pledge total loyalty in word and deed to the Lamb of God who bore our griefs and carried our sorrows in his determination to finish the work of salvation in our behalf. In spite of betrayal and pain, mistreatment and cruelty, and bearing all the accumulated sins and sorrows of the human family, the Son of the living God looked down the long path of mortality, saw us this weekend, and said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Have a blessed, joyful, peaceful Easter. Its untold possibilities have already been paid for by the Prince of Peace whom I love with all my heart, whose church this is, and of whom I bear unequivocal witness, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 
As a boy, I remember driving in the car with my father and seeing individuals on the roadside who had found themselves in difficult circumstances or who needed help. My father would always make the comment, pobrecito, which means poor little one. On occasion, I watched with interest as my father would help many of these people, especially when we would travel to Mexico to see my grandparents. He would typically find someone in need and then go privately and provide that help that they needed. I later discovered that he was helping them enroll in school, buy some food, or provide in some way or another for their well-being. He was ministering to a poor little one that came across his path. In fact, in my growing up years, I cannot remember a time when we did not have someone living with us who needed a place to stay as they became self-reliant. Watching these experiences created a spirit of compassion towards my fellow man and for those in need. In Preach My Gospel, it states, you are surrounded by people. You pass them on the street, visit them in their homes and travel among them. They are all children of God, your brothers and sisters. Many of these people are searching for a purpose in life. They are concerned for their future and their families. Throughout the years in serving in the church, I've tried to seek after those who needed help in their lives, both temporally and spiritually. I would often hear the voice of my father saying, Pobrecito, poor little one. In the Bible, we find a wonderful example of caring for a poor little one. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them, then entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. In reading this account, I was intrigued by the use of the word fastening. The word fastening means to direct one's eyes, thoughts, or look intently at. As Peter looked at this man, he saw him differently than others. He looked past his inability to walk and weaknesses and could discern that his faith was adequate to become healed and entered into the temple to receive the blessings he was seeking. I noticed that he took him by the right hand and lifted him up as he assisted the man in this way. The Lord miraculously healed him and his feet and ankle bones received strength. His love for this man and a desire to help him caused an increase of capacity and ability in the man who was weak. While serving as an Area 70, I reserved each Tuesday night to do ministering visits with the stake presidents in my area of responsibility. I invited them to make appointments with those who were in need of an ordinance of the gospel of Jesus Christ or who were not currently keeping the covenants that they had made. Through our consistent and intentional ministering, the Lord magnified our efforts and we were able to find individuals and families who were in need. These were the poor little ones who lived in the different stakes where we served. On one occasion, I accompanied President Bill Whitworth, the president of the Sandy Canyon View Stake, to do ministering visits. He was prayerful about whom we should visit, trying to have the same experience as Nephi, who was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which he should do. He demonstrated that as we minister, we should be led by revelation to those who are most in need, as opposed to just going down a list or visiting people in a methodical way. We should be led by the power of inspiration. I remember going into the home of a young couple, Jeff and Heather and their little boy, Kai. Jeff grew up an active member of the church. He was a very talented athlete and had a promising career. He began to drift away from the church in his early teenage years. Later, he got into a car accident, which altered the course of his life. We became, as we entered, into the home and became acquainted with Jeff asked us why we came to see his family. We responded that there were about 3,000 members who live within the state boundaries. I then asked him, Jeff, of all the homes we could have visited tonight, tell us why the Lord has sent us here. With that, J Jeff became emotional and began to share with us some of his worries and some issues that they were dealing with as a family. 
we began to share various principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We invited them to do a few specific things that might seem to be challenging at first, but in time would bring great happiness and joy. When President Whit then President Whitworth gave Jeff a priesthood blessing to help him overcome his challenges, Jeff and Heather agreed to do what we invited them to do. About a year later, it was my privilege to watch Jeff baptize his wife, Heather, a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They are now preparing themselves to enter the temple to be sealed as a family for time and all eternity. Our visit altered the course of their lives, both temporally and spiritually. The Lord has stated, Wherefore, be faithful. Stand in the office which I have appointed unto you. Succor the weak, lift up the hands that hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. And in doing these things, thou wilt do the greatest good unto thy fellow beings, and wilt promote the glory of him who is your Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul taught a key element in our ministering. He taught that we are all the body of Christ, and members in particular, and that each member of the body is needed to ensure that the entire body is edified. He then taught a powerful principle that entered deeply into my heart when I read it. He said, Much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Hence, in each ward and branch we need everyone, those who may be strong and those who are perhaps struggling. All are necessary to the vital edification of the entire body of Christ. I often wonder who we are missing in our various congregations that would strengthen us and make us whole. In 1849, Brigham Young had a dream where he saw the prophet Joseph Smith driving a large her herd of sheep and goats. Some of these animals were large and beautiful. Others were small and dirty. Brigham recalled looking into the prophet Joseph Smith's eyes and saying, Joseph, you've got the darndest flock I ever saw in my life. What are you going to do with them? The prophet, who seemed unconcerned with his unruly flock, simply replied, Brigham, they are all good in their places. When President Young awoke, he understood that while the church will gather a variety of sheep and goats, it was his responsibility to bring all in and allow each of them to realize their full potential as they took their places in the church. Brothers and sisters, the genesis of my talk came as I thought deeply about one who is not engaged in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For a moment, I'd like to speak to each one of them. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught that such individuals often stay proximate to, but do not participate fully in, the Church. They will not come inside the chapel, but neither do they leave its porch. These are they who need and are needed by the church, but who in part live without God in the world. I would echo the invitation of our beloved president, Russell M. Nelson, as he first spoke to the membership of the church. Now to each member of the church, I say, keep on the covenant path. Your commitment to follow the Savior by making covenants with him and then keeping the covenants will open the door to every spiritual blessing and privilege available to men, women, and children. He then pleaded, quote, Now if you have stepped off the path, may I invite you with all the hope in my heart to please come back. Whatever your concerns, whatever your challenges, there's a place for you in this, the Lord's church. You and generations yet unborn will be blessed by your actions now to return to the covenant path. I bear witness of him, even Jesus Christ, the master minister, and Savior of us all. I invite each of us to seek out the pobrecitos, the poor little ones among us who are in need, is my hope and prayer in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In 1994, a genocide took place in the East African country of Rwanda that was partly due to deep-seated tribal tensions. Estimates are that more than half a million people were killed. Remarkably, the Rwandan people have in large part reconciled, but these events continue to reverberate. A decade ago, while visiting Rwanda, 
my wife and I struck up a conversation with another passenger at the Kigali airport. He lamented the unfairness of the genocide and poignantly asked, if there were a God, wouldn't he have done something about it? For this man, and for many of us, suffering and brutal unfairness can seem incompatible with the reality of a kind, loving Heavenly Father. Yet he is real, he is kind, and he loves each of his children perfectly. This dichotomy is as old as mankind and cannot be explained in a simple soundbite or on a bumper sticker. To begin to make some sense of it, let's explore various types of unfairness. Consider a family in which each child received a weekly monetary allowance for doing common household chores. One son, John, purchased candy. One daughter, Anna, saved her money. Eventually, Anna bought herself a bicycle. John thought it was totally unfair that Anna got a bike when he didn't. But John's choices created the inequality, not parental actions. Anna's decision to forego the immediate gratification of eating candy didn't impose any unfairness on John because he had the same opportunity as his sister. Our decisions can likewise yield long-term advantages or disadvantages. As the Lord revealed, if a person gains more knowledge and intelligence in this life through his diligence and obedience than another, he will have so much the advantage in the world to come. When others receive benefits because of their diligent choices, we cannot rightly conclude that we've been treated unfairly when we've had the same opportunity. Another example of unfairness stems from a situation my wife Ruth encountered as a child. One day, Ruth learned that her mother was taking a younger sister, Merla, to buy new shoes. Ruth complained, Mom, it's so unfair. Merla got the last new pair of shoes. Ruth's mother asked, Ruth, do your shoes fit? Ruth replied, well, yes. Ruth's mother then said, Merla's shoes no longer fit. Ruth agreed that every child in the family should have shoes that fit. Although Ruth would have liked new shoes, her perception of being treated unfairly dissipated when she saw the circumstances through her mother's eyes. Some unfairness cannot be explained. Inexplicable unfairness is infuriating. Unfairness comes from living with bodies that are imperfect, injured, or diseased. Mortal life is inherently unfair. Some people are born in affluence, others are not. Some have loving parents, others do not. Some live many years, others few, and on, and on, and on. Some individuals make injurious mistakes even when they're trying to do good. Some choose not to alleviate unfairness when they could. Distressingly, some individuals use their God-given agency to hurt others when they never should. Different types of unfairness can merge, creating a tsunami of overwhelming unfairness. For instance, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affects those who already are subject to multifactorial underlying disadvantages. My heart aches for those who face such unfairness, but I declare with all my aching heart that Jesus Christ both understands unfairness and has the power to provide a remedy. Nothing compares to the unfairness he endured. It wasn't fair that he experienced all the pains and afflictions of mankind. It wasn't fair that he suffered for my sins and mistakes and for yours. But he chose to do so because of his love for us and for Heavenly Father. He understands perfectly what we're experiencing. Scripture records that ancient Israelites complained that God was treating them unfairly. In response, Jehovah asked, 
For can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? As unlikely as it is that a loving mother would forget her infant child, Jehovah declared that His devotion was even more steadfast. He affirmed, Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. Because Jesus Christ endured the infinite atoning sacrifice, He empathizes perfectly with us. He's always aware of us and our circumstances. In mortality, we can come boldly to the Savior and receive compassion, healing, and help. Even while we suffer inexplicably, God can bless us in simple, ordinary, and significant ways. As we learn to recognize these blessings, our trust in God will increase. In the eternities, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ will resolve all unfairness. We understandably want to know how and when. How are they going to do that? When are they going to do it? To my knowledge, they haven't revealed how or when. What I do know is that they will. In unfair situations, one of our tasks is to trust that all that is unfair about life can be made right through the Atonement of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ overcame the world and absorbed all unfairness. Because of Him, we can have peace in this world and be of good cheer. If we let Him, Jesus Christ will consecrate the unfairness for our gain. He will not just console us and restore what was lost. He will use the unfairness for our benefit. When it comes to how and when, we need to recognize and accept, as did Alma, it mattereth not. For God knoweth all these things, and it sufficeth me to know that this is the case. We can try to hold our questions about how and when for later and focus on developing faith in Jesus Christ, that He has both the power to make everything right and yearns to do so. For us to insist on knowing how or when is unproductive and, after all, myopic. As we develop faith in Jesus Christ, we should also strive to become like Him. We then approach others with compassion and try to alleviate unfairness where we find it. We can try to make things right within our sphere of influence. Indeed, the Savior directed that we should be anxiously engaged in a good cause and do many things of our own free will to bring to pass much righteousness. Someone who has been anxiously engaged in combating unfairness is Attorney Brian Stevenson. His legal practice in the United States is dedicated to defending the wrongly accused, ending excessive punishment, and protecting basic human rights. Some years ago, Mr. Stevenson defended a man who had been falsely accused of murder and was condemned to die. Mr. Stevenson asked the man's local Christian church for support. Even though the man wasn't active in his church and was disparaged in the community due to a widely known extramarital affair. To focus the congregation on what really mattered, Mr. Stevenson spoke to them about the woman accused of adultery who was brought to Jesus. The accusers wanted to stone her to death, but Jesus said, He that is without sin, let him first cast a stone at her. The woman's accusers withdrew. Jesus did not condemn the woman, but charged her to sin no more. After recounting this episode, Mr. Stevenson observed that self-righteousness, fear, and anger have caused even Christians to hurl stones at people who stumble. He then said, We can't simply watch that happen. And he encouraged the congregants to become stone catchers. Brothers and sisters, not throwing stones is the first step in treating others with compassion. 
The second step is to try to catch stones thrown by others. How we deal with advantages and disadvantages is part of life's test. We'll be judged not so much by what we say, but by how we treat the vulnerable and disadvantaged. As Latter-day Saints, we seek to follow the Savior's example to go about doing good. We demonstrate our love for our neighbor by working to ensure the dignity of all Heavenly Father's children. With our own advantages and disadvantages in mind, reflection is healthy. For John to understand why Anna got the bike was revealing. For Ruth to view Merla's need for shoes through her mother's eyes was enlightening. To try to see things with an eternal perspective can be clarifying. As we become more like the Savior, we develop more empathy, understanding, and charity. I return to the question posed by our fellow passenger in Kigali when he lamented the unfairness of the Rwandan genocide and asked, if there were a God, wouldn't he have done something about it? Without minimizing the suffering caused by the genocide, and after acknowledging our inability to comprehend such suffering, we replied that Jesus Christ has done something about infuriating unfairness. We explained many gospel precepts concerning Jesus Christ and the restoration of His Church. Afterwards, our acquaintance asked, with tears in his eyes, You mean there's something I can do for my dead parents and uncle? We said, Oh, yes. We then testified that all that's unfair about life can be made right through the Atonement of Jesus Christ, and that by His authority, families can be joined together forever. When faced with unfairness, we can push ourselves away from God, or we can be drawn toward Him for help and support. For example, the prolonged warfare between the Nephites and the Lamanites affected people differently. Mormon observed that many had become hardened, while others were softened because of their afflictions, insomuch that they did humble themselves before God. Don't let unfairness harden you or corrode your faith in God. Instead, ask God for help. Increase your appreciation for and reliance on the Savior. Rather than becoming bitter, let Him help you become better. Allow Him to help you persevere, to let your afflictions be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Join Him in His mission to heal the brokenhearted, strive to mitigate unfairness, and become a stone catcher. I testify that the Savior lives. He understands unfairness. The marks in the palms of His hands continually remind Him of you and your circumstances. He ministers to you in all your distress. For those who come to Him, a crown of beauty will replace the ashes of mourning. Joy and gladness will replace grief and sorrow. Appreciation and celebration will replace discouragement and despair. Your faith in Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ will be rewarded more than you can imagine. All unfairness, especially infuriating unfairness, will be consecrated for your gain. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We invite you, wherever you are, to join the choir in singing, Come, ye children of the Lord. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Neil L. Anderson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Thierry K. Matumbo of the Seventy, who recorded his message previously and is serving in this Africa Central Area Presidency.
This is the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Each of us has been affected by the worldwide pandemic as family and friends have unexpectedly moved beyond mortality. Let me acknowledge three we dearly miss, representing all those we love so much. This is Brother Philippe and Sister Germain Nassoundi. Brother Nassoundi was serving as the patriarch of the Brazzaville Congo Stake when he passed away. He was a medical doctor who shared his talents generously with others. This is Sister Clara Ruano de Villarreal from Tucan, Ecuador. She embraced the restored gospel at age 34 and was a beloved leader. Her family said goodbye, singing her favorite hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. This is Brother Ray Tuineau from Utah with his beautiful family. His wife, Juliet, said, I want my boys to remember that their dad always tried to put God first. The Lord has said, Thou shalt live together in love, insomuch that thou shalt weep for the loss of them that die. While we weep, we also rejoice in the glorious resurrection of our Savior. Because of him, our loved ones and friends continue their eternal journey. As President Joseph F. Smith explained, we cannot forget them. We do not cease to love them. They have advanced. We are advancing. We are growing as they have grown. President Russell M. Nelson said, our tears of sorrow turn to tears of anticipation. Our eternal perspective not only enlarges our understanding of those who are continuing their journey beyond mortality, 
but also opens our understand, understanding of those who are earlier in their journey and just now entering mortality. Each person who comes to earth is a unique son or daughter of God. Our personal journey did not begin at birth. Before we were born, we were together in a world of preparation where we received our first lessons in the world of spirits. Jehovah told Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Some may question if life begins with the formation of an embryo, or when the heart begins to beat, or when the baby can live outside the womb. But for us, there is no question that spirit daughters and sons of God are on their own personal journeys, coming to earth to receive a body and experience mortality. As covenant children of God, we love, honor, nurture, safeguard, and welcome those spirits who are coming from the premortal world. For a woman, having a child can be a great sacrifice physically, emotionally, and economically. We love and honor the amazing women of this church. With intelligence and wisdom, you bear the burdens of your family. You love, you serve, you sacrifice, you strengthen faith, minister to those in need, and greatly contribute to society. Years ago, feeling deep concern for the number of abortions in the world, President Gordon B. Hinckley addressed the women of the church with words that are relevant for us today. He said, You who are the wives and mothers are the anchors of the family. You bear the children. What an enormous and sacred responsibility that is. What is happening to our appreciation of the sanctity of human life? Abortion is an evil, stark and real and repugnant, which is sweeping over the earth. I plead with the women of this church to shun it, to stand above it, to stay away from those compromising situations which make it appear desirable. There may be some few circumstances under which it can occur, but they are extremely limited. You are the mothers of the sons and daughters of God whose lives are sacred. Safeguarding them is a divinely given responsibility which cannot be lightly brushed aside. Elder Marcus B. Nash shared with me the story of a dear 84-year-old woman who, during her baptismal interview, acknowledged an abortion many years before. With heartfelt emotion, she said, I have carried the burden of having aborted a child every day of my life for 46 years. Nothing I did would take the pain and guilt away. I was hopeless until I was taught the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I learned how to repent, and suddenly I was filled with hope. I finally came to know that I could be forgiven if I truly repented of my sins. How grateful we are for the divine gifts of repentance and forgiveness. What is our responsibility as peaceful disciples of Jesus Christ? Let us live God's commandments, teach them to our children, and share them with others who are willing to listen. Let us share our deep feelings about the sanctity of life with those who make decisions in society. They may not fully appreciate what we believe, but we pray that they will more fully understand why, for us, these decisions go well beyond just what a person wants for his or her own life. If an unanticipated child is expected, let us reach out with love, encouragement, and when needed, financial help, strengthening a mother in allowing her child to be born and continue his or her journey in mortality. In our family, we have been immeasurably blessed 
As two decades ago, a young 16-year-old learned that she was expecting a child. She and the baby's father were not married, and they could see no way forward together. The young woman believed the life she was carrying was precious. She gave birth to a baby girl and allowed a righteous family to adopt her as their own. For Bryce and Jolene, she was an answer to their prayers. They named her Emily and taught her to trust in her Heavenly Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ. Emily grew up. How grateful we are that Emily and our grandson Christian fell in love and were married in the house of the Lord. Emily and Christian now have their own little girl. Emily recently wrote, Throughout these last nine months of pregnancy, I had time to reflect on the events of my own birth. I thought of my birth mother, who was just 16 years old. As I experienced the aches and changes that pregnancy brings, I couldn't help but imagine how difficult it would have been at the young age of 16. The tears flow even now as I think of my birth mother, who knew she couldn't give me the life she desired for me and unselfishly placed me for adoption. I can't fathom what she might have gone through in those nine months, being watched with judging eyes as her body changed, the teen experiences she missed, knowing that at the end of this labor of motherly love, she would place her child into the arms of another. I am so thankful for her selfless choice that she did not choose to use her agency in a way that would take away my own. Emily concludes, I'm so thankful for Heavenly Father's divine plan, for my incredible parents who loved and cared for me, and for temples where we can be sealed to our families for eternity. The Savior took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him into his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of these children in my name receiveth me. I express my love and compassion for righteous couples who marry and are unable to have the children they so eagerly anticipate and to those women and men who have not had the opportunity to marry according to God's law. The unrealized dreams of life are difficult to understand if viewed only from the perspective of mortality. As the Lord's servant, I promise you that as you are faithful to Jesus Christ in your covenants, you will receive compensating blessings in this life and your righteous desires in the eternal timeline of the Lord. There can be happiness in the journey of mortality even when all of our righteous hopes are not realized. After birth, children continue to need our help. Some need it desperately. Each year, through caring bishops and your generous contributions of fast offerings and humanitarian funds, the lives of millions and millions of children are blessed. The First Presidency recently announced an additional $20 million to assist UNICEF in their global efforts to administer 2 billion vaccines. Children are loved by God. It is concerning that even in some of the most prosperous countries of the world, fewer children are being born. God's commandment for His children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force. When to have a child and how many children to have are private decisions to be made between a husband and wife and the Lord. With faith and prayer, these sacred decisions can be beautiful, revelatory experiences. I share the story of the Lang family of Southern California. Sister Rebecca Lang writes, In the summer of 2011, life for our family was seemingly perfect. We were happily married with four children, ages nine, seven, five, and three. My pregnancies and deliveries had been high risk, 
And we felt very blessed to have four children, thinking that our family was complete. In October, while listening to General Conference, I felt an unmistakable feeling that we were to have another baby. As Legrand and I pondered and prayed, we knew that God had a different plan for us than we had for ourselves. After another difficult pregnancy and delivery, we were blessed with a beautiful baby girl. We named her Brielle. She was a miracle. Moments after her birth, while still in the delivery room, I heard the unmistakable voice of the Spirit. There is one more. Three years later, another miracle. Mia, Mia, Brielle and Mia are a tremendous joy for our family. She concludes, being open to the Lord's direction and following his plan for us will always bring greater happiness than relying on our own understanding. The Savior loves each precious child. He took their little children one by one and blessed them. And they cast their eyes toward heaven and they saw angels descending out of heaven in the midst of fire. And the angels encircled those little ones about, and the angels did minister unto them. I testify that your own personal journey as a child of God did not begin for you as the first flow of earth's air came rushing into your lungs. And it will not end when you take your last breath of mortality. May we always remember that each spirit child of God is coming to earth on his or her own personal journey. May we welcome them, safeguard them, and always love them. As you receive these precious children in the Savior's name and help them in their eternal journey, I promise you that the Lord will bless you and shower his love and approval upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. My beloved brothers and sisters, I'm so grateful for the privilege to address you from Africa. It is a blessing to have the technology today and to use it in the most effective way to reach out to you wherever you are. In September 2019, Sister Mutomo and I, while serving as leaders of the Maryland Baltimore Mission, had the privilege to visit some church historical site in Palmyra, New York, while attending the Mission Leadership Seminar. We ended our visit in the Sacred Grove. Our intention in visiting the Sacred Grove was not to have a special manifestation or a vision, but we did feel God's presence in this sacred place. Our hearts were filled with gratitude for the Prophet Joseph Smith. On the way back, Sister Mutombo noticed that I had a big smile while driving. So she asked, what is the reason for your excitement? I responded, my dear Natalie, the truth will always triumph over error, and darkness will not continue on earth because of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. God the Father and Jesus Christ visited the young Joseph Smith to bring to the light what was hidden, so we may receive the knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they will be. After almost 200 years, many still seek the truth needed to become free of some of the traditions and the lies that the adversary spreads throughout the world. Many are blinded by the subtle craftiness of man. In his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul thought, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from dead, and Christ shall give thee the light. The Savior promised that he will be the light unto all that hear his words. Thirty-five years ago, my parents were also blinded. I were desperately seeking to know the truth and were concerned about where to turn to find it. My parents were both born in the village, where the traditions were rooted in individuals and family lives. 
They both left village when they were young and came to the city looking for a better life. They were married and started their family in a very modest way. We were almost eight people in a small house. My parents, two of my sisters and I, and the cousin who used to live with us. I was wondering if we were truly a family, as we were not permitted to have dinner at the same table with our parents. When our dad returned from work, as soon as he entered the house, we were asked to leave and to go outside. Our nights were very short as we could not sleep because of the lack of harmony and true love in our parents' marriage. Our home was not only small in size, but it was a dark place. Before meeting with the missionaries, we attended different churches every Sunday. It was clear that our parents were seeking for something that the world could not provide. This went on until we met with Elder and Sister Hutchings, the first senior missionary couple called to serve in Zaire, known today as DR of Congo or Congo Kinshasa. When we started meeting with these wonderful missionaries, who, like, who were like angels that came from God, I noticed that something started to change in our family. After our baptism, we truly started to progressively have a new lifestyle because of the restored gospel. The words of Christ began to enlarge our souls. They began to enlighten our understanding and became delicious to us as the truth that we received were discernible and we could see the light. And this light grew brighter and brighter daily. This understanding of the why of the gospel was helping us to become more like the Savior. The size of our home did not change, neither did our social conditions. But I witnessed a change of hearts of my parents as we prayed daily, morning and evenings. We studied the Book of Mormon. We held family home evening. We truly became a family. Every Sunday, we woke up at 6 a.m. to prepare to go to church, and we would travel for hours to attend church meetings every week without complaining. It was a wonderful experience to witness. We, who previously walked in darkness, chased darkness from among us and saw great light. I remember one day when I was not willing to wake up early in the morning for our family prayer, I murmured to my sisters, there is truly nothing else that we can do in this home, only pray, pray, pray. My dad heard my comments. I remember his reaction as he lovingly but firmly taught me, as long as you will be in this house, you will pray, pray, pray. My father's words sounded in my ears daily. What do you think Sister Mutombo and I do with our children today? We pray, pray, pray. This is our legacy. The man that was born blind and was healed by Jesus Christ, after being pressured by his neighbors and the Pharisees, said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received sight. One thing that I know is that I was blind, now I can see. We also were blind and can now see. The restored gospel has impacted our family since that time. Understanding the why of the gospel has blessed three generations of my family and will continue to bless many generations to come. Jesus Christ is the light that shines in darkness he that follows him shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. For almost a year, between 2016 and 2017, the people in the Kasai region faced a terrible tragedy. It was a very dark period for the people because of a conflict between a traditional group of warriors and government forces. The violence spread from towns in Kasai, central province, to wider Kasai region. Many people fled their homes for safety and hide in the bush. They had no food or water or not anything, really. 
And among these were some members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Saints in the Kasai, in the Kananga area. Some members of the church were killed by the militia. Brother Honore Mulumba of the Nganza Ward in Kananga and his family were some of the few people who remain hidden in the house, not knowing where to go, because all the streets were transformed into firing ranges. One day, some neighborhood militiamen had noticed the presence of Brother Mulumba and his family, as one evening they went out to try to find some vegetables in the family garden to eat. A group of the militiamen came to their home and then pulled them out and told them to choose to adhere to their militia practices or they will be killed. But Brother Mulumba courageously told them, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My family and I have accepted Jesus Christ and have faith in Him. We will remain faithful to our covenants and will accept to die. They told them, as you have chosen Jesus Christ, your bodies will be eaten by the dogs. And they promised to come back, but they never did come back. And the family stayed there for two months and never saw them again. But Mulumba and his family kept the torch of their faith alight. They remembered their covenants and were protected. Jesus Christ is the light that, should, that we should hold up even during the dark times of our mortal life. When we choose to follow Christ, we choose to be changed. A man changed for Christ who will be captained by Christ and will be asking, as Paul did, Lord, what will thou have me to do? We will follow his step. We will walk even as he walked. I testify of him that died was buried and rose again the third day and ascended into heaven so that you and I receive the blessings of immortality and exaltation. He is the light, the life, and the truth. He is the antidote and remedy to the confusion of the world. He is the standard of excellence for exaltation, even Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful for all who have spoken to us this afternoon and for the beautiful music that has been provided. We remind the brethren of the priesthood session, which will be held this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. A previously recorded broadcast of music and the spoken word will be aired tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The Sunday morning session of conference will immediately fall. Our concluding speaker for this session will be President M. Russell Ballard, acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. The benediction will then be offered by Brother Mark L. Pace, who serves as Sunday School General President. Brothers and sisters, this Easter time, we focus on the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We remember His loving invitation to come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Savior's invitation to come unto him is an invitation to all to not only come unto him, but also to, to belong to His Church. In the verse preceding this loving invitation, Jesus teaches how this is done by seeking to follow Him. He declared, No man or woman knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man 
the Father, save the Son, and he, and I add, or she, to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus wants us to know God is a loving Heavenly Father. Knowing that we are loved by our Heavenly Father will help us know who we are and know that we belong to His great eternal family. The Mayo Clinic recently noted, having a sense of belonging is so important. Nearly every aspect of our lives is organized around belonging to something. This report adds, we cannot separate the importance of a sense of belonging from our physical and mental health, and I would add our spiritual health. On the evening before his suffering in Gethsemane and death on the cross, the Savior met with his disciples for the Last Supper. He said to them, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Before the sun set the following day, Jesus had suffered and had died on the cross for our sins. I wonder how the lonely and faithful women and men who followed him must have felt in Jerusalem as the sun set and darkness and fear encompassed them. Like these ancient disciples nearly 2,000 years ago, many of you may also feel lonely from time to time. I've experienced this loneliness since the death of my precious wife, Barbara, over two and a half years ago. I know what it is to be surrounded by family members, friends, and associates, but still feel lonely because the love of my life is no longer here beside me. The COVID-19 pan pandemic has highlighted this sense of isolation and loneliness for many. Nevertheless, despite the challenges we face in life, like the first Easter morning, we can awake to a new life in Christ with new and marvelous possibilities and new realities as we turn to the Lord for hope and belonging. I personally feel the pain of those who lack a sense of belonging as I watch news from time to time in the world, I see many who seem to be experiencing this loneliness. I think that for many is because they may not know that they are loved by Heavenly Father and that we all belong to His eternal family. Believing that God loves us and that we are His children is comforting and assuring. Because we are the spirit children of God, everyone has a divine origin, nature, and potential. Each of us is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. This is our identity. This is who we really are. Our spiritual identity is enhanced as we understand our many mortal identities, including ethnic, culture, cultural, or national heritage. This sense of spiritual and cultural identity, love and belonging, can inspire hope and love for Jesus Christ. I speak of hope in Christ not as wishful thinking. Instead, I speak of hope as an expectation that will be realized. Such hope is essential to overcoming adversity, fostering spiritual resilience and strength, and coming to know that we are loved by our eternal Father and that we are His children who belong to His family. When we have hope in Christ, we come to know 
that as we need to make and keep sacred covenants, our fondest desires and dreams can be fulfilled through Him. The Quorum of the Twelve Apostles have counseled together in a spirit of prayer and with yearning to understand how to help all who feel alone or feel they don't belong. We long to help all who feel this way. Let me mention in particular those who currently are single. Brothers and sisters, more than half of the adults in the church today are widowed, divorced, or have not yet married. Some wonder about their opportunities and place in God's plan and in the church. We should understand that eternal life is not simply a question of current marital status, but of discipleship and being valiant in the testimony of Jesus. The hope of all who are single is the same as for all members of the Lord's restored church. Access to the grace of Christ through obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. May I suggest that there are some important principles we need to understand. First, scriptures and Latter-day Prophets confirm that everyone who is faithful in keeping covenants will have the opportunity for exaltation. President Russell M. Nelson taught, in the Lord's own way and time, no blessing will be withheld from His faithful saints. The Lord will, be ju will judge and reward each individual according to heartfelt desire as well as deed. Second, precise time and manner in which the blessings of exaltation are bestowed, to be bestowed have not yet been revealed, but they are nonetheless assured. President Dallin H. Oaks explained that some of the circumstances of mortality will be set right in the millennium, which is the time for fulfilling all that is incomplete in the great plan of happiness for all of our Father's worthy children. Now that doesn't mean that every blessing is deferred until the millennium. Some have already been received and others will continue to be received until that day. Third, waiting upon the Lord implies continued obedience and spiritual progress towards Him. Waiting upon the Lord does not imply biding one's time. You should never feel like you are in the waiting room. Waiting upon the Lord implies action. I have learned over the years that our hope in Christ increases when we serve others. Serving as Jesus served, we naturally increase our hope in Him. The personal growth one can achieve now while waiting upon the Lord and His promises is an invaluable sacred element of His plan for each one of us. The contributions one can make now to help build up the church on earth and to gather Israel are much needed. Marital status has nothing to do with one's capacity to serve. The Lord honors those who serve and wait upon Him in patience and faith. Fourth, God offers eternal life to all His children, all those who accept the Savior's gift of repentance and live His commandments will receive eternal life even though they do not attain to all the characteristics and perfections in mortality. Those who repent will experience the Lord's readiness to forgive as He is assured. Yea, as often as my people repent, will I forgive them their trespasses against me. In the final analysis 
a person's capacity, desires and opportunities in matters of agency and choice, including qualifications for eternal blessings, are matters only the Lord can judge. Fifth, our confidence in these assurances is rooted in our faith in Jesus Christ, by whose grace all things pertaining to mortality are set right. All promised blessings are made possible through Him, who by His atonement ascended below all things and has overcome the world. He hath sat down on the right hand of God, the claim of the Father, His rights of mercy, which He hath upon the children of men. Wherefore, He advocateth the cause of the children of men. In the end, the sights, the saints, shall be filled with His glory and receive their inheritance as joint heirs with Christ. Our desire is that these principles will help all have increased hope in Christ and feel the sense of belonging. Never forget that you are a child of God, our eternal Father, now and forever. He loves you, and the Church wants and needs you. Yes, we need you. We need your voices, talents, skills, goodness, and righteousness. For many years we have talked about young single adults, single adults, and adults. Those designations can be administratively helpful at times but can inadvertently change how we perceive others. Is there a way to avoid this human tendency by that can separate us one from another? President Nelson asked that we refer to ourselves as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That seems to cover all of us, doesn't it? The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to unite us. We are ultimately more alike than we are different as members of God's family. We are truly brothers and sisters. Paul stated, And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth. Do you stake presidents, bishops, and quorum and sister leaders? I ask you to consider every member of your stake, ward, quorum, or organization as members who can contribute and serve in callings and participate in many ways. Every member in our quorums, organizations, wards, and stakes has God-given gifts and talents that can help build up His kingdom now. Let us call upon our members who are single to serve, lift, and teach. Disregard old notions and ideas that have sometimes unintentionally contributed to their feelings of loneliness and that, that they do not belong or cannot serve. I bear my witness on this Easter weekend of our Savior Jesus Christ and the eternal hope He gives me and all who believe in His name. And I bear this testimony humbly in His sacred name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, at the conclusion of this beautiful and inspiring session of General Conference, we bow our heads and we thank Thee for the privilege of having been here. We, Thy sons and daughters, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and as friends, rejoice in the teachings that we have heard this day. The Spirit has witnessed to us of their truthfulness, and we thank Thee for the sweetness of this time and for the blessing it has been to us. We love Thee. We love Thy Son, Jesus Christ. We love learning of Him, and we love learning how to live His gospel in this world at this time. We thank Thee for President Nelson, for his inspired leadership, and we thank Thee for all the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve, and for their inspired guidance and blessing to us. Thank Thee again, Heavenly Father, for this sweet time. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 This has been a broadcast of the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square from previous general conferences. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>